right now. Right, perfect. Um, yeah, hello everyone. Um, great that you could all make it to today's talk, um, which is going to be about um, the climate crisis and climate action, both um, on an individual level, but also on a more like large scale level. And we thought it might be nice by kind of introducing ourselves first, so you know why we're actually doing this and who we are. Um, and then we'll dive a bit more into sort of the presentation structure and the different parts that we'll be talking about. What's maybe also nice to know is that um, this will be partially interactive, um, so um, we need some input from you as well. And we're also hoping to have a nice discussion at the end. So if you have a bit more time at the end to stay um, and discuss some of those topics with us and maybe also give some insights, um, yeah, we would really appreciate that. Um, so maybe we'll start by introducing ourselves. Perhaps, yeah, I can just start since I'm talking anyway, and then I'll hand over. Um, so I'm Marlene, I'm part of um, PTC Germany, and I'm in the data science team. So I usually work as a data science consultant, but on the side, I'm like fairly active um, in the political sphere as well. And one of the issues I really care about is, um, yeah, uh, sustainability and the climate crisis. And so uh, within PTC, I'm part of, um, sort of we call them the co2 group uh, in ptc germany so we're kind of just trying to work on different ways that we can make ptc germany a bit more sustainable by for instance raising awareness um, but also pushing for certain things like um, sort of more climate friendly team events um, for instance and this particular talk is part of sort of our awareness raising um, activities but also our international efforts to kind of connect across the different ptc chapters and um, yeah, to collaborate on this particular topic. And I'll hand over to Vera. <laughs> yeah, you nearly said everything. So uh, I basically <laughs> just have to say that uh, my name is Vera and uh, I'm also in the data science team. Um, Marlene and me were uh, yeah, leading the CO2 group together and um, all the, the initiatives on, on this behalf. And uh, yeah, we could, we were able to motivate Maxime uh, to do this uh, webinar with us, which is, uh, yeah, very cool. Um, and I kind of like directly hand over to you, Maxime, because I think you have more to say than me. <laughs> yes, thank you. Uh, and so I'm Maxime and I'm, I'm um, working in the IT department of the group. Uh, and um, I've I had some interest in uh, climate and energy for the past two years at least, and I started uh, some small uh, initiatives in Belgium, and then uh, started work uh, worked uh, closely with uh, CSR as well, and then I think this is uh, kind of how uh, we met with uh, Vera and Marlene uh, and had this idea of uh, joining efforts to to do this um, this talk, this presentation and talk, uh, uh, like in an international event for the group. So, hope you'll enjoy. Yes, I think we can move over to the next slide. Um, yeah, so this is about the um, content of today's presentation. So I will start off by kind of talking about what trajectory are we on right now? What is the situation at the moment? What are some of the um, sort of political debates we're having, what is um, the whole question surrounding like the 1.5 and 2 degree target, um, so just kind of shedding some light on that. Then Maxime is going to go a little bit more into um, what are the different industries that are responsible for um, a large part of our emissions and the climate crisis and sort of what are the levers that can be pulled. Um, then Vera will continue um, by talking a little bit more about Kind of how can we be sustainable in our daily decision making on an individual level what are kind of the areas of our lives we can look at and potentially improve and to also provide some sort of um yeah more action oriented input i guess so you don't all leave completely depressed after this presentation <laughs> and then in the end uh, we would like to have a little bit of yeah an open discussion Okay, so I think we can actually move over to my part. Um, yeah, so as I said previously, I'm going to be talking about the trajectory and I'm sure like none of us um, is a climate denier, um, but I think we all really like data visualization. And so I included something that I recently came across. Um, it's a visualization by someone from NASA and it shows um, global uh, temperature anomalies between 1880 and 2021. 
So the difference between sort of the long term average temperature and um, the temperature that is occurring occurring in a given month. And I think this really sort of drives the point home how much um, the process has accelerated during the past years and past decades. Yeah, I think now you can really nicely see that, especially in a second. Yeah. Yeah, so this is kind of just to start off the talk and show you where we're at right now. Um, that we're basically around 1.2 degrees of warming uh, compared to pre-industrial levels. So my first quiz question for you, which hopefully Maxime will post into the chat soon, <laughs> is if yes. the current warming rate continues, um, so if we follow the trajectory we're on right now. Um, by what point would we reach human induced global warming of 1.5 degrees? What do you guys think? I will share the form right now. Yeah, a bit of time to think. <laughs> so normally it's appearing uh, in front of your screen and you can select an answer and submit. It'd be interesting to follow this in the chat myself, <laughs> see what people think. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Oh, yeah. yeah, I think basically all of you are pretty right. So estimates vary a little bit. Um, most people say, like a lot of scientists say by 2040 for sure, <clears throat> but obviously depending on how much we reduce, <clears throat> how much we reduce emissions and so on, that could also be 2035. Um, but uh, yeah, most of the estimates point towards 2040, which, as we all know, is not that far off. So this brings me to the second part. Um, I'm sure many of you have kind of heard the term 1.5 degree target thrown around, but perhaps not all of you know where this is actually coming from, like what is the sort of arbitrary number. Um, and so basically this was decided at the um, Paris Agreement, which um, yeah, was adopted at the Paris Climate Conference, the COP21, in 2015. And uh, this was kind of a bit groundbreaking because it was the first legally binding international treaty on climate change. But in this case, legally binding doesn't mean what you might all think. Um, it basically just says that every five years countries have to say um, what their plans are for climate action. So these are called national determined contributions. And every five years, these need to be more ambitious, but nothing is happening if they don't actually fulfill them. So it's not legally binding in the sense that anyone can like punish a country for not having fulfilled their goals. Um, so as we are also aware, is, uh, all countries are basically very much lagging behind their own goals. Um, and they are definitely not meeting, or we are currently definitely not meeting uh, the goal of limiting global warming to 1.5 degrees or a maximum of two degrees. Um, but I think what's also important to think about, um, oh sorry, not yet, <laughs> when we think about the 1.5 degree target is what does that really mean? So the reason why policymakers chose this particular target was they basically agreed that with 1.5 degrees, that's the kind of warming that we can still cope with as humanity. So it's a compromise. It's not saying 1.5 degrees is great, we're all gonna have a good life. It's saying those are risks we can still carry as humanity. And um, previously they thought actually with two, two degrees, this is also still okay, humanity can cope with that. Um, but as we will see in a bit, um, that is not the case. And more and more scientific consensus, most policymakers have moved away from that and are really saying actually 1.5 degrees is our um, hard limit. Um, so this is kind of how this whole 1.5 degrees goal came about. Uh, then I think, yeah, you could probably move to the next thing. <laughs> and the other thing that's important to know, because I'll be talking about this for a bit, um, later on I will go into the latest climate report by the um, IPCC. So I thought it might be important to briefly say what the IPCC is, in case you've heard it, Lucy, but you're not entirely sure. Um, so the IPCC is the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. 
And that's basically a very, very big group of climate scientists. So they could be coming from um, economics, from political science, from the physical sciences. It's really from all different um, fields of study. And they produce reports every five to seven years um, that deal with different aspects of the climate crisis. So we have different working groups, um, which I think you can skip to the next. <laughs> Point, uh, different working groups that focus on different topics. So one is um, the physical basis of climate science, that report has been published. Then the other one is, um, the second one is effects of climate change and adaptation. This is the report I'll be talking about today. And the third report deals with ways of cutting emissions. And then the fourth one is kind of like a summary of all the different reports, which will be presented at the next um, COP meeting. So um, yeah, this is kind of just to give you a background on what the IPCC actually is. Um, yeah, and as a kind of a point to drive all of this home, as a summary of the slide, <laughs> there's no safe level of global warming. 1.5 degrees <clears throat> is a compromise already. Um, so this is important to keep in mind when we talk about this target. And then I think we can move over to the next slide. Um, yeah, so a question that sort of I had been asking myself when I first started researching this topic was, does half a degree really make a difference? Because when you hear it like 1.5 or 2 degrees, it doesn't really sound like that big a difference, right? So I was wondering, what does that actually mean in terms of real impacts um, this has on yeah, humanity in the end. So these are just some examples. Um, obviously, there are a lot more, but these are just some I gave which was a bit more tailored to Europe since I reckon most of us are from Europe actually. Um, and so you can already see that there are quite substantial differences between 1.5 and 2 degrees. So the maximum temperatures in parts of Europe will be quite a lot higher. The probability of um, massive heat waves uh, is more likely, which can lead to mortality. Um, you have um, a greater percentage of shared regions with risk of flooding. You have no corals, basically, at two degrees, so you will have no coral reefs anymore. They will be super, super rare. And um, yeah, that's much more um, large scale with two degrees than it is with 1.5 degrees. Um, and then also it has huge uh, impacts on biodiversity. Um, so with two degrees as opposed to 1.5 degrees, um, like insects, plants, and vertebrates, um, there, there's a greater percentage of these that will lose half of their current range. And this has huge implications also for pollination, for instance, which is important for agriculture and so on. Um, yeah, so this can really have quite a big impact. Um, and I think you can move to the next point. Yeah, so I think what we what scientists have generally concluded is two degrees are much worse than 1.5 degrees in terms of the impact and 2.5 degrees will be exponentially worse and so on. So um, it's not really a binary option of like we do something, we do nothing, like any action helps, but like we should consider that the, the results will still be very different depending on what degree of warming we're at. Um, and the other thing that's very important when we talk about 1.5 and 2 degrees are um, so-called tipping points uh, in the climate system, because um, the probability that these tipping points occur rises substantially if you move from 1.5 to 2 degrees. And previously, scientists kind of thought, OK, this is really only going to be a danger if we're talking 3 to 4 degrees of warming. But they've now realized, actually, there's already significant risk with 1.5 degrees, and that will be even higher with 2 degrees. And kind of to talk about what a tipping point actually is, it basically means that we have um, certain phenomena where if you pass a certain critical threshold, that will lead to often irreversible change. So I think you've probably heard about permafrost or the Greenland ice sheet. Those are sort of called tipping points, and they're probably around 15 tipping points overall. Um, and the danger or what scientists fear a little bit is that if you cross one tipping point, that cascades. So then that might also trigger other tipping points to cross. Um, so this is why like this is sort of another reason for why we really don't want to cross these 1.5 degrees. Um, also, because quite often you might end up in a bit of a vicious cycle with, for instance, the permafrost where like carbon dioxide and methane is released and then that further heats up the earth and so on. So you just get stuck in this loop um, of just heating and thawing and so on. Um, yeah, so this is um, something that um, is kind of really emphasized in the climate report and that's also something that a lot of 
scientists really fear these tipping points because it's quite hard to predict when this will actually happen. And once something has been triggered, it's a bit like a very heavy train, like you might put a blockade in front and try to stop it, but it will take a really long time for it to actually stop if we even get to that point. Um, so yeah, that makes these uh, quite difficult to deal with. And uh, maybe as a third point, um, which perhaps you've heard before, but basically um, sort of the influence we have on this planet is so immense that um, some geologists actually call it the Anthropocene, um, where they're basically saying that human activity had a significant impact on the planet's climate and ecosystem. So we kind of have our own um, uh, yeah, geologic time in the end, uh, which yeah, was pretty crazy to me as well. So yeah, this is kind of to sort of set the stage. There's a bit of like just background knowledge, a brief overview of sort of where we're at, what is the political debate, uh, which I thought would be useful to know before we move into the IPCC report. Um, so as I mentioned previously, the IPCC report is exactly about kind of the risks of the climate crisis, but also adaptation. I'll go a bit more into what adaptation means in a second. But the first part is basically risks. And I wrote down a few of the key takeaways or that I think are the key takeaways. Um, obviously, if you have read up on this yourself, like feel free to maybe fill in some gaps later. But one thing that very much stood out to me, which I'm guessing a lot of you know, is that the world's poorest and most margin marginalized are unfairly paying the highest price for the climate crisis. So the climate crisis is really hitting some people harder than others. Um, and it furthers inequality. So <laughs> if you can hear it, it has a bit of background noise. Um, and so, yeah, I thought related to this, so related to uh, the climatic inequality, um, I thought this would be a nice quiz question. And it is, what percentage of global emissions are the wealthiest 10% of people responsible for? And yeah, we have the options 25%, 70%, 50 or 35%. Very curious to see <laughs> the answers. <laughs> and maybe to put this into context, all of us would be in the wealthiest 10%. Uh, I'm fairly certain because it's around an income of like 30,000 30, per year. Interesting. So you actually think it's even higher than it actually is, which now makes the figure <laughs> seem a bit less impressive maybe. But um, yeah, the richest 10% are responsible for 50% of the emissions. And to put that into perspective, the poorest 50% are only responsible for 7% of the emissions and the richest 1%. So these will be people with an average income of like 90,000 and above. Um, they are responsible for 15% of CO2 emissions. So as we can see, kind of um, the people who are responsible for the climate crisis are definitely not the ones who are actually um, suffering the most from it. So that leads to a huge inequality, which I think we can go back to the next slide. Um, and it's not only kind of poverty that plays into this, a lot of it is also sort of geographic location. So yeah, just where you're born, um, as you probably all know in Europe, we are, especially in Northern Europe, we're much less at risk um, than we are in a lot of other places of the world. So if you are on an island or you're in a desert or you're in the polar regions, you're much more at risk of um, climate impacts than somewhere else. Um, yeah, then the next point, which I think kind of follows up quite nicely, is that half of the people on Earth live in places where they're at high risk of harm from climate change. So this means they're already at high risk. Um, so half of the people on Earth already experience some sort of water insecurity for parts of this year, which is a huge number if you think about it. It's around like 3.6 billion people. And I think, I mean, all of us have probably also followed extreme weather events in places like Australia, but even Germany. So we're already experiencing things like um, you know, flooding or um, wildfires and so on. So this this is already happening. We're already seeing this. And then these events, um, they also worsen each other. So they don't really happen in isolation. Um, you can have sort of cascading effects, 
So for instance, if the sea level rises, combined with that, you might have more storms and heavy precipitation, which means you have more flood risk. So this can destroy natural habitats, wipe out crops, lead to bad water quality, um, lead to disease risk and so on. So these things really don't happen in isolation. They kind of feed off each other and make each other worse. And then the fourth point, um, which I touched upon already, if we warm over 1.5 degrees, it will cause severe harm that is irreversible, even if it cools later. So this is particularly relevant for these tipping points we talked about before. Um, so once we pass them, which will be much more likely um, beyond 1.5 degrees, it doesn't matter if in 50 years we have very smart solutions to somehow cool the world or we, you know, get our act together and actually um, emit less CO2, like things will have already been put in motion. So we won't get a lot of the things back that we have lost. Um, but maybe to end a bit more on a hopeful note, um, the IPCC report is also saying that a livable future remains within grasp, but the window of opportunity is brief and rapidly closing. So right now there's still definitely a chance to act to prevent things from absolutely escalating, but it does require a lot of collective action. Um, yeah, which I think <laughs> brings us to the next point. Um, yeah, so I thought maybe what's also interesting, because quite often um, I briefly touched upon this already, but when we talk about um, sort of the harm of the climate crisis, we focus on other areas than Europe. So I thought it would be interesting to briefly shed some light on Europe and what it actually means for us. Um, so some of the risks we have are flooding, water scarcity, mortality due to heat and heat and drought stress on crops. And all of these impacts will obviously be more severe if we move beyond 1.5 degrees. But I think what's also interesting is, which is the next point, um, that these impacts will hit different parts of Europe unequally. So um, I found this quote, which says that in Southern Europe, more than a third of the population will be exposed to water scarcity at a global warming level of two degrees. So this would be if the two degree um, scenario occurs. Um, and we're really not prepared for that. So within the European Union, we don't really talk about how climate change will impact us differently. And, you know, obviously we're already struggling a little bit with cohesion and unity. And uh, this is something that should be transparently discussed, that uh, the climate crisis will impact like Southern Europe much more than Northern Europe, for instance. Um, if you look at the IPCC page, it's actually saying that Europe might, Northern Europe might benefit briefly from <laughs> the climate crisis because of like increased crop yields and so on. But obviously these things will also, um, these risks will also increase more and this positive impact will vanish once we, we move beyond a certain degree of global warming. Um, and we can go to the next point. Um, yeah, so, and when we talk about these things, um, what's maybe also interesting to know is that most EU climate spending is going towards measures to reduce emissions and not adaptation. So we're still trying to reduce our emissions, which good, but we are at the same time not adapting to what is in store for us in the future. And I think the next point I already said, um, yeah, we're just talking about regional differences. Oh, and sorry, one more point <laughs> if we go back, uh, which may be interesting. Obviously, even if Europe isn't as hard hit, we live in an interconnected globalized world. So the fact that other parts of the world are very hard hit will still impact us in terms of imports, right? And cultural imports, but also maybe energy imports, migration and so on. So even if these risks might not seem as drastic as some other risks, the fact that um, you know, maybe parts of Africa experiencing huge uh, crop failure and uh, drought and so on will still have an impact on us that doesn't happen in isolation. So I think that's also important to keep in mind. And then we are moving on to the last part of my presentation. And I think, oh, I need to be a bit faster maybe. <laughs> yeah. Um, so this particular IPCC report is focusing on um, climate adaptation. So instead of mitigation, it's really saying, what can we do to reduce the risks or the impact of the climate crisis? Both today, so what we're already experiencing today and in the future. So thinking ahead, what could be potential scenarios and how can we mitigate those risks? Um, so I thought what was interesting to find out is that a lot of countries actually already have climate policies that include adaptation, but that's purely planning and very few of them have actually implemented any sort of adaptation projects. 
So the EU isn't very different from other countries in that sense. Um, and adaptation also only accounts for just 48% of track climate finance. So it's really not a focus area yet. It's still very focused on mitigation when these things should really be pursued with sort of equal force at the same time. Um, yeah, so there are different ways that you can sort of adapt um, to the current situation and the IPCC is splitting them up into three different categories. So the first one is social programs that improve um, equity and justice. So this might seem a little bit vague, but it kind of um, points back to the point I made earlier about the climate crisis really exacerbating inequality. Um, and so one idea is that um, you, for instance, a lot of it is like knowledge sharing, cash transfers and so on, or things like insurance for, for instance, farmers to have more long term planning to be insured against things like drought and so on. Um, so that's to re that really has to happen based on a local context. So this is not something you can just do large scale and everywhere. Um, but um, yeah, to really help kind of um, the people who are most vulnerable to the climate crisis to respond um, to what they're facing and to also just um, educate them on, you know, the impact of what is going to happen and to, for instance, diversify their livelihoods so not to only um, rely on like one particular way of earning their income, but maybe to yeah diversify it a bit more. So if one thing doesn't work out, then at least they have other things to rely on. Um, and then the second point is ecosystem based adaptation. So um, the idea kind of is that you get natural systems in better shape <laughs> and to suck up carbon and um, generally to have more sustainable agricultural practices. So that a bit more in line with how, for instance, indigenous communities um, would farm. And so one example that I found quite interesting is um, agroforestry. So there you basically grow um, trees or um, shrubs around um, crops or pasture land. And that way, like you protect your crops and your agricultural area from like extreme weather events. Um, you provide habitat for wildlife, um, you improve water quality and so on. So it's just thinking of small kind of changes um, that make whatever you're working on more resilient. And then the, uh, yeah, the third way to adapt, which I think also receives a lot of the attention, and new technologies and infrastructure to strengthen resilience. And there the um, IPCC is saying that this can also backfire. So there are a lot of good solutions, obviously. Things would, for instance, be early warning systems so that people know like when to flee a situation. But I think as the flooding in Germany, which I believe was last year maybe showed, uh, warning systems alone aren't enough. You actually need to have action that follows from that. So it isn't enough to have the information. People also need to know what to do with the information. Um, and people should also take it seriously, all the people who are in power and who can actually disseminate that information. Um, so yeah, it's coming up with plans on like how should we actually respond to these kind of emergency situations. Um, but yeah, as the IPCC said, that can also backfire. So one of the things that people might do is um, build like coastal seawalls seawalls which give sort of a false sense of security and that might also harm um, like protective ecosystems in that area so you really need to think about what are sort of the benefits or the trade-offs um, in the situation and technology isn't always the answer um yeah so i think this sort of concludes my part this was just to give you an idea about what's in this report what are some of the strategies people think about but as you can probably tell um and this is quite difficult, but governments need to start somewhere. And it's really, really important that more money gets spent on adaptation efforts um, so that also private finance will follow um, for that. Yeah, I will hand over to Vera <laughs> with that. Oh, no, not Vera, Maxime. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Thanks a lot, uh, Marlene, for this first part. I think you have all understood now um, the effects that uh, 1.5 degrees will have uh, and the importance of taking measures not only to uh, adapt uh, as uh, Marlene just uh, explained but also of course to reduce uh, emissions um, and it's important to understand what's behind emissions uh, you, you know if you want to reduce them um, this is where the the 
um, factors to climate change uh, come into place and everybody knows about the the actually the real cause which is usually um, which which are called the greenhouse gas emission uh, in french gaz à effet de serre so this is well known uh, by everyone and what you can see here on this graph is actually what causes those uh, greenhouse gas emissions and I like this graph because it's it's really clear uh, that when we're talking about greenhouse gas emission, we are actually talking about energy for almost uh, three quarters. You also have agriculture and forestry, which are uh, uh, almost one quarter and which are really important. But the rest is basically energy. And uh, usually people um, don't think of energy uh, as what it really is. Usually for the majority of us, it's basically the bill that you get at the end of the month for your electricity and your heating. Usually this is, this is what people think of when, when we talk about energy. But it, it's much more than that. It's, it's basically everything. The, for example, this call uh, is, is, is uh, possible because I have a laptop and because we have the internet. And if, if you want to have a laptop, you need to extract uh, matter from the ground. And this is, this is only uh, possible using energy. Same thing for the internet. You need servers. And to build those servers, you need, again, you need materials that you must extract from the ground. And again, you need energy. I think a good example to understand this is um, a, a simple T-shirt. Uh, so if Vera, if you can uh, move to the next slide. Yeah, this is really simple. It's like it's ex the, exactly the one I have here. It's a 100% cotton T-shirt. It's the most simple object you can think of. And I want to show to show you what's behind this T-shirt. So the first thing is cotton. Of course, you need uh, cotton and it means you need sun and you need water as, as energy source. But then you need to, uh, to harvest and to get this cotton. So you need machines, which 100% uh, runs on oil. And then you need also fertilizers. And as you know, uh, or as you don't know, maybe fertilizers are made of nitrogen, which is uh, made out of gas. And this is a good example of the crisis we have at the moment with Russia and Ukraine, is that uh, all the gas coming from, from those places are used for our fertilizers. And not only we will have a problem with cereal, cereals from Ukraine, but also with our own cereals from France, from Germany, because we, don't, we, don't, we cannot have uh, fertilizers anymore or at a very high price. So it's, it's really an issue. Then the next step of the process is to uh, actually uh, weave and dye the, 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 the tissue. And for this, you need factories. And usually those factories are not in Europe. So they are based on an electricity that is made out of coal or gas. And then for the dyeing, you, you also need uh, chemicals and that usually are done uh, with uh, oil. Then the next step is shipping and transportation and for this definitely you need oil especially for the boats but also for the trucks because the electricity uh, transportation is not adapted for the heavy weight uh, means of transportation so for boats and trucks at this moment it's 100 percent oil then the next step uh, is basically to go get it in 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 a shop in europe and usually the shops are, um, of course, uh, using electricity that is mostly done uh, with uh, coal and gas in Europe, with some exceptions like France or Norwegian. But it's usually mostly gas and, and coal. And of course, you have to go to the shop. And for this, you usually use your car. Uh, maybe some of you already have electric cars, but the vast majority in Europe is still running on oil. Uh, for the the car the car transportation, and we don't forget the last step, which is basically the the design of the t-shirt, which is done in an office. Uh, sometimes this office is in Europe. And then the electricity of the office can also be uh, done with uh, renewables uh, or nuclear energy, but it's basically energy all over again. 
and um, and that closed the circle. So you can see that from a very very simple product that is made of only one material, which is cotton, uh, you need all those steps. Steps, sorry, and those steps are all running on on energy, and most of them are fossil fuels. So oil, gas, and coal. So, um, in order for you to uh, to take another another example and understand um, the energy that is necessary behind uh, behind everything that we have in our daily lives, I want to ask the question of uh, a laptop. So we all have laptops. Usually, it's something like two kilos, and I want you I want you to guess the amount of uh, material we need to extract from the ground to build a simple laptop uh, of two kilos. So I'm just putting the answers here in the forums and I'm sending it so you can start thinking about it. And yes, OK, you will receive the form now. So just imagine a two kilo laptop. How much material do you need to 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 do it to extract from the ground? I can see some interesting answers. I will leave you a few seconds more. OK. Done. So I think only one person got the correct answer. So Vera, if you can move to the next slide, you will see that a simple laptop, uh, a two kilo laptop actually needs 800 kilo of resources, of, of raw materials. And I'm not talking about the millions of liters of fresh water. I'm only talking about the energy that you need to, to extract. So it's basically 200 kilo and it's always fossil fuels. And then also 600 kilos of raw materials, uh, usually uh, ores, metals, but also just uh, earth or dirt uh, from which you will extract the small pieces of rare metals that, that you will need uh, to, to build your, uh, your laptop. So this is again a good example of the huge amount of energy that is behind a simple objects from our daily lives, uh, like a laptop or a smartphone, of course. Uh, so you can tell that it's really not only about your electricity and heating of, of the house, it's really also about the things that you use in your, in your daily lives. And this is really important to understand. So I decided to take uh, an example of a country in Europe. Uh, I took France because I have a lot of data uh, about France to understand what does this energy represent in terms of usage. Uh, so you can see. Oh, sorry, it's uh, the. Can you type again, Vera? I I, I uh, did a mistake on this. OK, so you can see that the the majority of the energy that we use in France is about transportation and half of transportation is actually individual cars. So this is huge. This is really the, the biggest amount of energy that, that we use. Uh, then we, we have the industry, the agriculture, same as industry, same amount. Then the buildings and heating the buildings and then only the electricity. And there is a lot of debate about electricity, about uh, coal, gas, renewables, and nuclear uh, electricity. But you can see that in a country like France, electricity is only about 10% of our emissions. Uh, so it's not that big a deal, but uh, it's true that uh, the electricity is, is uh, quite low carbon in France. But still, when we talk about energy, uh, always remember that it's not only about electricity, it's also about transportation, industry, agriculture, buildings, etc. And something that we usually forget, especially the government when they publish the numbers, is that uh, we have to add the products that we import. And this is bringing the number to 50% more, actually 52% for France. So 
if you take into account the imported products, you 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 really uh, add half of our emissions uh, to our to our mix. So this is really really huge, and it's really something to to take into account that energy is not just about electricity and and things that we do in our country, but it's also and mostly about everything that's behind the product or a material that we import in the country. Uh, that's why uh, the, the question of the economic growth is usually uh, a point to consider when we talk about energy, because economic growth is about creating products and those products are uh, representing a lot of, a lot of energy. So uh, I was saying that usually the debate uh, on energy is about electricity. It's true that uh, electricity is, a, is, a, is an important part, uh, especially if the electricity is generating a lot of uh, emissions, and this is due to fossil fuels. So you can see on this graph that um, the coal, uh, the biomass plus coal, and uh, gas are really really the worst ways of creating electricity and there are a lot of debates in europe about this if you if you follow the topic you certainly have heard of all the discussions that we had in europe with what we what is called the taxonomy it's basically about adding the gas and the nuclear power to the green taxonomy in order to to beneficiate from uh, uh, green investment or green finance. And a lot of people or group of interest or organizations or even governments were actually trying to promote the gas uh, as a, uh, a nice way of, of creating electricity. And usually the argument is that it's twice better than the coal. And it's almost true. As you can see, the coal is like 100 uh, gram per kilowatt, while the gas is 490. So it's let's say it's half uh, better than uh, twice better than the, the coal. But when you compare with the renewables like solar or like uh, wind, or even with nuclear, you can see that it's that gas is actually. 10 times worse than uh, than those uh, means of uh, creating electricity. So the argument of uh, of of saying that gas is 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 really a good way to to improve the quality of electricity in terms of CO2 is really really not a good one and this is important to to understand. And not only from the CO2 perspective but also from the geopolitical perspective, of course, uh, since the current events that we have in Europe with uh, the war, definitely gas is at the heart of the debate and, and a lot of uh, countries are really trying now to, to reduce our dependency to, to gas. And as a, a nice example, I think a few days ago, the uh, Belgium has decided to maintain their nuclear uh, reactors while it's uh, it was actually more than five years that they decided to stop them so they did this because their strategy was mainly based on gas and with the war and the uh, and the price of gas that is that is rising up they decided to to uh, to review this strategy and to uh, rely more on nuclear so uh, they did not do it for the good reasons, because the good reason would have been more climate rather than the war. But still, um, it's a, it's a, it's a, an important thing to to notice. So um, that was my point uh, today. I think I will uh, leave now uh, the presentation to Vera. Thank you, Maxime. Yes, after seeing a bit into the industries that impact most um, yeah, climate change um, and especially like the, the energy consumption, um, let's have a look at what we can do, um, which probably is yeah also interesting um, because how I read lately, um, a lot of people making small changes results in big changes. So um, I think it, it totally makes sense to do something small 
um, to see the impact in the, in the bigger issue. And there is a lot of things that actually have big results as well. So which I found like very interesting on my research uh, on, on this whole topic is uh, that probably the biggest impact um, you can do is voting climate friendly. Um, so this is a very interesting um, survey or like not survey, but uh, research uh, in Canada where they uh, had a look at um, yeah how much um, energy you or like how much uh, greenhouse emissions you can uh, save uh, when when you vote climate friendly. Um, so as you can see in the in the small picture up here, um, it's actually a lot more than um, yeah, driving, for example, no car for one year um, when you vote climate friendly, um, which also makes sense a lot um, because people that vote um, are less people. So uh, you would, for example, for, I don't know, like Germany or France, your impact as a, as a voter um, is, is very high um, because you really uh, are not like, uh, yeah, one not in Germany like one of 80 million, but rather less people that actually vote and therefore uh, result in, in changes um, for, for the climate. The second thing that you can do is that you reach out to your representatives directly so that you would get into contact uh, with local re representatives and start to do small changes in your neighborhood. So it totally makes sense um, to, to take examples from your neighborhood. Um, for example, yeah, one like street where it would be nice to have no cars um, or complaining about cars in general to um, make cities more climate friendly in uh, general. Um, another thing uh, that sustainable that it yeah enables sustainable decision making um, can be the donations you are making. So uh, when you decide to donate, for example, for sustainable causes, um, this can also make big changes. And the last thing um, from this field is the media attention that you can create. Something that is very interesting because also Maxime and Marlene were uh, going into this before is um, actually consumption. So um, when we think about what is our personal climate footprint, um, there are a couple of things that come, come to mind. So most people, for example, think about air travels or um, about driving cars. But um, this actually shows you the climate footprint of an average European customer, uh, consumer, and you would see that 25% of your greenhouse um, gas emissions um, are based on consumption. As Maxime was explaining before with the t-shirt, uh, there is a lot of greenhouse emissions um, behind one simple product. So the more you consume, the more you would also have an impact on the climate. Um, what I want to point out at this point overall, um, it's generally better uh, if you try to reduce, for example, consumption a little bit um, than, yeah, doing it. Yeah, so like just it's better to do it a little bit than doing nothing at all. So uh, with uh, just reducing your climate footprint a little bit, you would always be better off than doing nothing. Um, so it's all about like starting and not about being perfect. Um, this totally, yeah, comes to mind when you think about this, because it's not possible to reduce all the consumption. Um, yeah, and let's go a bit into the fashion world where we have been before. Um, so fashion, for example, including the supply chains makes 5% of the world's greenhouse gas emissions, um, whereas air travel, for example, is just 2.5%. So you see that this really has a bigger impact than uh, what we think uh, is normally the, the biggest impacts we, we can have and uh, where you can really make a difference. Um, just to give you some like small examples, um, synthetics, um, yeah, account for 65% of the clothes. Um, they also lose, use a lot of oil. Um, so um, you really have a, a high impact with this kind of clothes um, on, the, on the oil consumption uh, of the world. Um, from a cotton perspective, as we saw before already, it's not essentially better um, because there's a lot of global water use um, based on cotton. Um, and there are a lot of pesticides used, uh, and as uh, Maxime was showing, a lot of other uh, things, um, yeah, that that are part of the the energy consumption. Ooh, yeah. Um. So what 
does this mean? It means actually reduce uh, reducing the, the consumption, um, rather repair things than buy them new, um, reduce things. So for example, um, buy second hand or sell your things, but second hand um, in, um, yeah, I think now overall Europe, we have this app, which is called Vinted, uh, where you can easily sell your clothes um, to other people. Um, I've used it myself. It's actually quite nice. Um, and also uh, for sure to recycle um, clothes. The second thing is that there are a couple of applications um, for carbon footprint calculations in general, but also for carbon footprints of products. Um, so one that is available in Germany for sure, I hope there are also available um, in, in Belgium and France, um, but if not, you will for sure find something similar um, where you can like see uh, what the climate footprint of a special product is and therefore can like rather choose um, products that have less, um, less impact. Yes, talking about food decisions here again, it's very important that just changing a little bit is already better than doing nothing um, because I think you all or most of it know it already because we've talked about this before in, in one of our talks that um, yeah, different foods have different climate impacts. And um, I just brought you a very nice graphic um, also for the for the data oriented people. I think it's very interesting where you can see um, of the yeah, greenhouse gas emissions of different products. Um, let's make it a bit bigger for you. Um, so just uh, that you can see, I wanted to point out um, yeah, a couple of, of points here. Um, there are like very different kinds of food and um, they have like a different impact. Um, concerning like the whole supply chain. Um, in red, you see here the transport um, and you can see that actually the red part is not a big part in, in all of the, um, yeah, the, the data or for all of the food actually. So you can see that the transport is not that big um, compared to other things like, for example, land usage or um, yeah, farming in general. Um, so yes, this accounts for food that is not traveled by um, by plane. Um, so when food is traveled by plane, this changes a little bit, but still um, the most things, um, yeah, like don't have much um, carbon footprint um, based on, on transportation. Yeah, just so that you can see that, I think it makes sense to go a bit deeper into it if you're interested, um, mostly the plant-based, um, yeah, or like plants in general, vegetables in general, have less uh, impact on the environment um, than, than meat and dairy-based products. As I was saying, the air travel um, might change this a, a little bit. Um, in general, if you want to reduce your air traveled food, um, this was quite interesting for me um, as well. Um, there is like a rule of thumb how you can, how you can know if something is air traveled because it's less food than you would think. Um, so mostly it's food um, that has long travel, uh, long ways, um, but a very short shelf life. So for example, yeah, berries or green beans or asparagus are part of this. Um, and uh, yeah, then um, as I was saying, this results um, that it makes sense to increase plant-based meals in your diet. Doing a little bit is always better than, than doing nothing at this point. And I think um, also very interesting is to see um, down here a little bit, perhaps we can also go a bit deeper into that um, to see the fresh water withdrawal per, per 100 grams of protein. Um, so if you're interested in this, you can uh, definitely have a closer look afterwards. Um, we will yeah, send you the presentation for sure uh, and see what kind of proteins um, yeah, might, be, might be interesting for you. So another point where you definitely have some options and where you can act um, are your banking habits. Um, so banks often invest into, for example, fossil fuels, um, which have a yeah, bad influence, as we learned before, on, on the climate. And um, you can see here in the graphic that in the last years, uh, the global investment into energy supply and especially in especially into fossil fuels uh, in, in, in gray here, were very big. So most of the investments were actually going into fossil fuels. 
as it is planned right now, this would even increase um, for for the next years. Um, so for 2025 to 2030, um, this would even increase. Um, and uh, yeah, it would be way better to rather reduce it um, than increase it. So what does it mean now for you? Um, you can try or like you can try, you should or you could <laughs> choose a bank um, that doesn't invest into fossil fuels. Um, I have a link here for you which could help you on this, um, finding something that is very, um, yeah, that is rather called a green bank. Um, but we wanted you to be careful at this um, because there is a lot of greenwashing going on. Um, so yeah, really have a look at uh, comparisons and see um, if a bank is really what they what they want to do. Um, so nice, um, yeah, side effects are here that they um, invest into renewables, um, more efficient housing, biodiversity, but also as a bonus benefit um, into other, um, yeah, sustainable sustainability um, criteria um, which are rather like from the social or, or the governmental um, perspective um, which is a nice bonus benefit of this okay let's get into the last quiz question of tonight um, we just wanted to yeah like hear if you have uh, an idea of how many times more um, CO2 you emit um, when you fly from Paris to Barcelona. Um, we picked this because it's probably something you would fly. It's around 900 kilometers, um, but it's uh, yeah also something people perhaps know about. Um, so compared uh, a flight compared to to a direct train journey, what would you think? Um, how many times more CO2 is emitted? And I hope Maxime is pulling up the form right now on the screen. Perfect. Nice, quite interesting to see. I think OK, so I know most of you have answered. Um, I'm actually very happy because um, you're right. That's cool. I didn't expect this too much, but um, that's perfect, actually. So yeah, you can see here that um, uh, a flight from, from Paris to Barcelona um, would take you 21.6 uh, uh, um, times more um, yeah, impact on, on the climate than you would have if you take a train, which is um, actually, yeah, perhaps something to say with this, that I did this last year. I actually started from Munich uh, to travel to Barcelona by train. Um, it was a very nice travel. I stopped for one night in Paris and even it, actually the 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 train from, from uh, Paris to Barcelona was just amazing because it's so fast. Uh, and I even saw flamingos on the way. So that was also quite nice for this. <laughs> So yeah, in general, you can see that um, trains uh, emit way less, um, yeah, carbon dioxide or like in general um, greenhouse gases um, on uh, yeah on the travel. So it definitely makes sense to rather choose the way of traveling slowly with trains, something like that, to reduce your flights. Um, something that is also interesting if you're flying, perhaps it can make sense uh, to rather pick a direct flight and do not do stopovers because this also increases uh, the, the negative impact of the flight and um, yeah, the emissions in general. Yes, and then coming slowly to an end, some smaller measures um, you can do are to reduce your room temperature by only one degree, which already saves you um, yeah, 300 to 600 kilograms. Um, staying below 130 on the streets um, is roundabout in the same um, area per year, and uh, also, yeah, saving saving energy um, here uh, makes makes a huge impact. So all these are smaller things you can do, um, and as I said in the beginning already, just starting to change a little bit your habits um, already makes a big impact. Yes, I think that's it from our side. Uh, we collected some resources uh, in the end. As I said, we will provide you with a presentation for sure. And um, we can come into our questions and open discussion part. And I think I will close the presentation so that you can ask your questions or share your impressions, whatever. Um, should we stop the recording before? What do you think? Yeah, yeah. maybe. Okay.
then ah, I'm not sure if I can stop it. I will try. Ah, yeah, I can. Perfect. 